So what I'm here to do is to set down five, five factors. You might even think of them as rules if they work. Five factors that will hopefully give some suggestion of how to make this change, how to adapt. And of course, this being PR, I'm going to start off by giving context, but I'm going to start before the context by plugging my own book. So this is the book. <laughs> As Eric said in the introduction, what I've sought to do in writing this is to look back over the four or five decades that we've come through and to see what is, at the most simple level, what are the things that have changed and what are the impacts that they have had. And the conclusion that I came to as I finish this book is that our generation, you and me, we are at a very unique moment in time. It's unusual for a generation to be at a hinge in history. And I think that that's what we're at. This is why, as we look towards the future, things look so different to how they were in the past. So think about the era that we are children of. We are children of the industrial era. So we're heading into a digital era. And this all sounds quite trite. It's quite easy to say. But if you think about the technologies that shaped the world that we grew up with, you'll see just how archaic they are compared to what we're going towards. So, of course, we're part of a generation that is shaped by rail, that is shaped by telegraph, that is shaped by steam and steel. And the common features of these technologies and how they were applied <coughs> is that they relied on standardization and they were used to bring power and control to central points, to central points of authority. And there's no better way to, to demonstrate just what that means than by taking a look at, at what ships and what telegraph and, and what rail was used to do. Let's take a look at a map from 1896. So this is a map of uh, Britain and her imperial possessions. And as you can see, it's a map of a pole of control. This is the industrial world. This is what it means. It means that you have limited points of control and then outreach, hub and spoke pattern. <clears throat> so this is the old centralized order that we are moving from, but we still have its assumptions. Something pretty big must have happened to change this, to make this no longer be what we have to adapt our businesses for. And that change was, of course, the Cold War, specifically probably the detonation of Sarbama, the largest ever thermonuclear uh, detonation by the Soviets, and of weapons like it. So a year before Sarbama was detonated, sorry, a year afterwards uh, that Sarbama was detonated, in 1962, Paul Baran, a researcher working at the Rand Corporation in the United States, was trying to figure out how to make the national communications infrastructure more robust. There was a real problem, because at that point, Nuclear weapons were getting increasingly easy to fire, but once either side fired them and had suffered a first strike, they had very little way of communicating to their weapons to make a second strike. And what that would mean is that mutually assured destruction couldn't actually occur because the first strike would obliterate the other side's ability to make a second strike. So what Baran realized was something radically new was needed. And <clears throat> what, it, what he decided was the, po the, the, the problem here is that we are looking at a communications infrastructure that has single points of control. So here's Paul Baran. And what he, his problem was that a nuclear detonation in the ionosphere would cripple FM radio, and a few nuclear strikes would obliterate the very centralized AT&T uh, telephone network. And that would mean that you couldn't launch your own nukes. So the problem was right here, the central node. This is the problem that Paul Baran sought to eradicate. And the solution that he came up with was so revolutionary that it took a long time before anyone believed it could work. And as soon as it started to work, it changed all of our businesses. In fact, it set the new pattern for how things were going to happen. What Baran said was, what we have to do is take control from the central point and we have to put that control in all of the subordinate nodes so that each node in the network is equally powerful, has equal control, and there is no hierarchy of control. So this is the centrifugal pattern 
that Paul Baran came up with in uh, 1962. There's a reason why I'm telling you about the Cold War and about nuclear strikes and about resilient infrastructure. And that is that this pattern that, that Baran drew up in his early documents is the emerging pattern of the digital era. You can look at uh, political campaigns, social media, whatever you want. It all works this way, and it used to work the other way. So let's take a look at how this network evolved. And as we do take a look, bear in mind that the argument I'm making here is that the smallest element of participation is now the individual node, just as Baran planned in his networks. So transactions, insults, interactions, all of them happen at the individual level. The focus is on the individual. So let's take a look at how the network evolved. Back in uh, 1969, when they finally got around to building a test network called ARPANET, there were four nodes connected. As that went on, uh, 1970, 1972, 1977, and eventually 2007, we know how it worked out. <clears throat> but going back to 1969, the purpose of this original network had moved on. Brand's ideas had been canned. So this wasn't about nuclear infrastructure anymore, nuclear-proof infrastructure. This was about resource sharing. All of these machines, these are the first four machines that were connected. All of these machines were multi-multi-million dollar investments. And the US Department of Defense, which was supporting these machines, thought, if we can find a way for other researchers to network into these machines, then we can save money by buying fewer of them. It was a simple idea. And the idea was of resource sharing. So these are the first four machines. Now, as soon as they were installed and gradually started to be used, what was it that these, that these scientists, using an incredibly expensive set of machines on a new infrastructure, what was it that they were, that they were actually doing? What they were actually doing was discussing science fiction, because, of course, they're computer scientists. The first things that these guys were doing was chatter. So the four most popular mailing lists that dominated traffic on this new network were Science Fiction Lover first, The Wine Appreciation Society second, I think hacking may have been uh, number three, and then some sort of tech support, which is getting close to a legitimate use, I think was number four. <clears throat> so this human chatter thing, this social communication is in the DNA, so to speak, of the network. It's been there from the beginning. And of course, it's still there today. This is a list of the top 10 most popular destinations on the internet. I just, it's a check from Alexa uh, earlier in the year. So there are, there are 10 entries here. But if you remove the content that isn't actually content, that's just a search engine or a portal, and I've just done that here, you see that the ones that stand out in the top 10 are Facebook, YouTube, uh, Blogger, Wikipedia, and Twitter. So this is users talking to each other. There is no top-down, one-to-many communication in the top 10 on the internet today, which is quite remarkable. So the first of those five points I was mentioning, the first one is that organizations have to recognize that they are in a completely new uh, dispensation. And they must begin to respect the new power of individuals. Not because they should, but because they have to. Time magazine, uh, in some circles, was pilloried. It was, uh, uh, people thought it was maybe a bit sloppy that in 2006, it said that you were the person of the year. And actually, they were way ahead of the game. Time realized what, what we all now recognize, that the individual is king. But the second rule, in a sense, leads on from that. And that is that organizations must accept a new plasticity of information. So by plasticity, what I mean is that information is now increasingly changeable and unreliable and uncontrollable. So as communicators, you, and you know this, can no longer control the message in the way that you once did. What made information plastic in the way I'm describing? If you're unconvinced, maybe this will make the case. What made this change was Ajax in about 2004. So Ajax is, it was a new generation of web technologies. And it, it allowed websites, which previously had been static, had been imparting information. 
to become collaboratory. So people could uh, leave comments, they could edit videos, they could upload their own photographs, etc. So what Ajax did was it made the internet and the web into a platform for participation. And so from 2004 onwards, we see Web 2.0 begin to be spoken about. This is what it means. But one of the people involved in coining Web 2.0, Tim O'Reilly and his colleague, Dale Duggerty, it was Duggerty who coined the phrase perpetual beta. It seems to me that perpetual beta is the best way of describing this new plastic information. Dale Duggerty was speaking at a conference in 04, and he, he spoke to computer programmers and entrepreneurs, and he said, listen, guys, this is the established way that you release your software. Normally, it goes from pre-alpha to alpha to beta to release candidate. The beta and the release candidate are given to a very small set of users who test them and come back with the mistakes that the programmers need to know about. And only then is the product released to market. Now, in the new context of Web 2.0, where users could start to contribute information, <coughs> what Duggerty was suggesting is that you should start to bring in users. You should start to bring users in at the beta stage, release the product, and then just iteratively keep changing it. You should admit that there will be flaws in your, in your product. You should, in a sense, be weaker and let a periphery of users make your product stronger. So in a sense, he was saying, let your pants down and let the users take over a little bit. So the perpetual beta. I find it easiest to understand what a seismic shift the perpetual beta is by looking back at St. Jerome. St. Jerome was commissioned in uh, 382 AD by Pope Damascus. He was commissioned to take all of the parts of what would become a Bible and consolidate them. It was Jerome who wrote what we now know as the Latin Vulgate, which became the official, the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. So Jerome faced the problem that we all now face, but that our parents didn't. Jerome faced the problem of plastic information. He started on his Bible in uh, 382 AD, and over a 1,000 years later, in 1542, at the Council of Trent, it was decreed that Jerome's Vulgate would be the sole and only text that would be permitted uh, to be used as the Bible. So the full weight of a highly centralized, hierarchical organization like the church, which had a disciplined, professional core of scribes whose sole job was to make sure that the Bible did not get, in any sense, uh, changed or edited, and that its authority was maintained. This organization was now saying, this text is the only one that we will allow to uh, be used. Around about the same time, however, Erasmus, a biblical scholar, said, the problem is there are as many different editions of the, Val of the Vulgate as there are copies. And that is because before the arrival of the printing press, scribes had been working by candlelight, with berry juice, on animal hide. They had been using technologies that were incapable of perfect reproduction. So what changed this was the printing press. And in as much as we are children of the age of steam, rail, and telegraph, this has been said many times. But what does this actually mean? If you take a look back in what might be called the oral tradition before the printing press, let's take a look at a 13th century Bible. This is the Paris Bible, 13th century. It's a beautiful text. But when you look at the margins, you see that there are, there are bits added, there are, there are lines left in. It's imperfect. In a sense, that's what makes it beautiful. And then when you take a look at the Gutenberg Bible, this is a copy from the New York Library. When you take a look at the Gutenberg Bible, you see the difference between pre-printing press and post-printing press. There is no deviation with this text. The organization that produces it is in control. So what I'm suggesting is that from 2004 onwards with Web 2.0, it's not just that things have changed a little bit. It's that we are reverting to an entire different order of, of information. And let me give you an example from Wikipedia. If you take any controversial article on Wikipedia, for example, this one on jihad, you'll get a note that says, 
Uh, sorry, guys, this may be in dispute. You can click here to see how that dispute works. <clears throat> so what I'm going to show you now is a list of edits to this Wikipedia page. Each line on this list denotes one revision. So each revision could be many lines, could be many hundreds of words. So each line is an edit, and I've just taken two years. And as we scroll down, you'll see that there are 36 pages of A4 print with a line on each edit. So this is plastic information. This is information that you can't control as pure professionals or as communicators. So just to make the point again, what I'm saying is that we are children of the red bit, of the era of inflexible information. And all of our assumptions come from a world in which we can control the message. But what we really should be thinking is of an earlier time in which information was entirely plastic and in which you had to accept that. Okay, so from the mid-15th century to the early 21st century, that's the anomalous era in history, and it's gone. So information is now plastic, it's changeable, unreliable, malleable. And of course, for you, this is a seismic shift, as it is for me, for governments, for organizations all around the world. There's a few questions about how we should adapt to that. Anyway, let me get on to point number three. And point number three is again about giving up control. When a campaign or an organization is an underdog on the internet, in a sense, it has an advantage. <clears throat> the question is, how do all organizations take this advantage? The internet enables something very interesting in that it enables a weak actor to reach into a periphery of support. Just like um, Dale Duggarty told the computer coders they could get their user base to contribute to improving a software product. The idea is that the periphery of support can strengthen your campaign. And what I find amazing is that there were examples of people attempting to do this at a macro level in the past that absolutely failed. So I'm going to use a lot of political examples in this section to, to prove this, this rule or fact. The first is from 1992. In the United States uh, Democratic primary campaign, Jerry Brown, uh, Jerry Brown ran to get the, the Democratic nomination for president. And he ran a super grassroots campaign. He said, everyone else is looking for large donors and has really, really strong organizations behind them. I'm a minor candidate. <coughs> I'm running on a principal ticket. And I do not have major donors. In fact, what he said was uh, he would only accept donations that were $100 or less. So in US campaigning terms, this is revolutionary stuff back in 1992. Now, Jerry Brown's only way of reaching funders and supporters was to set up a toll-free phone line so that people could phone in with donations. The remarkable thing is that Jerry Brown was actually amazingly successful. He even threatened Bill Clinton at that time, and uh, I think he came in as the number three also ran. But what Jerry Brown proved was that the infrastructure to connect a campaign of any type with a periphery of supporters who were individually weak but collectively strong, the infrastructure at that point did not exist. An 800 phone number wasn't going to cut it. So, <clears throat> so something changed clearly between then and the Obama campaign. And it's worth reflecting on what that is. What changed probably most is network effects. Network effects are spoken about very widely. Um, they, they were probably in their most prominent during the first dot-com bubble, where a lot of companies thought they could get big fast and use network effects to make profits afterwards. But what's really interesting about network effects is to see how the assumptions about them have changed. So here is David Sarnoff, the founder of NBC. David Sarnoff is probably one of the the exemplars of the one-to-many style of broadcast 
media. Sarnoff's network effect was n equals n. The power of my audience is equal to the number of my audience, one to many. Okay, so if I'm broadcasting to 20 people, I'm broadcasting to 20 people, and that's the end of the story. Theodore Vail, on the other hand, this is uh, back in 1908. Theodore Vail was pushing the idea of the telephone. He was president of AT&T in the United States. And what Theodore Vail said was that a phone is useless unless you connect it to another phone. And the utility of the phone increases with the number of other people who you connect to. So the idea was not that I might phone everyone in this audience, but that my phone gives me the opportunity to do that. So the power of the network was equal to the number of people I could potentially connect to and who could connect to each other. And a refinement of that came from uh, Robert Metcalf. Robert Metcalf is the inventor, in a sense, of Ethernet. And when he left the research outfit where he was working on, on networking in the 80s, he had the difficult task of going into large organizations that had lots of personal computers and saying, you need to start networking these computers because when you network them, your employees will be able to, to do magical things that they can't do when the computers are on their own. And he coined a kind of a rule of thumb. What he said is, it's not about the number of machines that I'm directly connected to. It's about the work that I might do because I'm connected to all these possible people. So the idea was that n equals 2 to the power of n. <clears throat> so this maybe is the power of networks. That the network is judged not only by what it can do, but what it might do. And the person who proved this in politics in 1998 was a Navy SEAL turned wrestler, turned actor, turned politician. If anyone has seen the film Predator, you'll be amazed to know that in the helicopter, on the way to kill the alien, there were actually two future governors in that helicopter. It's not just Arnold Schwarzenegger, it's also Jesse the Body Ventura. Jesse is an interesting character. This is him from his days at the World Wide Wrestling Federation. So Jesse the Body became Jesse the Governing Body back in 1998. <coughs> and this is crazy, because when he started off, he had one member of staff, a tiny budget, he was campaigning in Minnesota against people who were professional politicians, he certainly wasn't, who had large staffs, large budgets, and were supported by the two major political parties. He didn't have a single precinct worker in place. And in a sense, he was the weakest possible uh, candidate or campaign that, that could have run. So what his campaign did was they started to exploit the internet. Now remember, this is back in 1996, uh, 1998. So email is just coming in, and people are starting to get connected. And Jesse Ventura's campaign started to send out lists of where they would be, and they started to co-opt people to organize events for when Jesse would, would drive by. And what happened was that people started to actually, of their own volition, set up events as Jesse would come. They would start to work as if they were part of Ventura, and it worked. So Jesse became governor, <clears throat> and he's an example of leveraging support at the periphery. But I think this is only half the story. I'm going to show you David Reed. David Reed is a network engineer, and uh, he was one of the people involved in establishing uh, some internet protocols. And what Reed argued was that Metcalfe's law, remember, n equals 2 to the power of n, that Metcalfe's law was actually insufficient to describe the power of networks. What Reed said was that n doesn't just equal what it says there, it equals something else. That the power of networks scales exponentially in a curve, and that is because if you can get enough people in a community, they can start among themselves to form communities that are self-directed. They can take the initiative and work on your behalf without your direction. So the Ventura campaign was giving direction, but the real secret is when you give less direction and let the periphery start to take over control. It's all about that new pattern of letting the nodes be self-directed and take more control. 
And we've seen what can happen. This is one of the things that made the funding drive of the Obama campaign really work. But before the Obama campaign, of course, there was Howard Dean. And it was Howard Dean who nailed, who nailed this question. When Dean started off in his campaign for the presidency in Vermont, he had 500 names of supporters, that's all, in shoeboxes around his house. He had something like half a million dollars, and he had a staff of seven. He was a political asterisk. He didn't exist. He was an also-ran. He didn't have a hope. By the end of his first year campaigning, he had raised more money than any other Democrat in history, including Bill, Print, uh, including Bill Clinton, when Clinton was running as the incumbent president. So there was something special in what Howard Dean was doing. And we can see that a lot of his staff members went off to work for the, for the Obama campaign later. And what was special was that the principles of the Dean campaign drew very, very heavily on Linux and the Linux project. This book here, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, written by Eric Raymond, sets out the principles of the Linux project. The idea that, on the one hand, you have companies like Microsoft who build things like cathedrals. These things are perfect, and they conform to a certain plan. And on the other hand, you have people like the Linux community who behave more like a bazaar, a market. So there's a lot of talk, a lot of noise, but they're all working towards a common goal, perhaps. And it's an untidy way of working that leverages a, a strong periphery with a weak core. So the idea behind the cathedral and the bazaar was one that was absolutely accepted by Howard Dean's campaign manager, Joe Trippi. <clears throat> and Joe Trippi had worked for Progeny Linux Systems back in 2001, so three years before the Dean campaign. And he was a longtime political campaigner and he decided with the Dean campaign that they were in such a weak point that they could afford to experiment. And his experiment changed how politics would work or how campaigning would work from then on. What Trippi realized was the need to let the, peri the periphery of supporters take more control. This is a quote from him. He says, I've been in seven campaigns. Normally what you do is you control from the center just like that, that model of the empire, just like that model of communications before Buran. You control from the center and you tell everyone what to do very rigidly. And what we have to do is to let go of control as much as possible. We provide a flag, we provide some direction, but we have to respect the individual because the user is increasingly king. So what he was saying is the Linux guys have it right and we as a political campaign have to take some of what they're saying on board. It's hard to let go, <clears throat> but that's what we're going to do. So part of that then comes into rule number four. Rule number four is probably entirely obvious, but I think it might be, um, it might be quite difficult for a lot of organizations. And that is, in a situation where the user is increasingly king, where organizations are increasingly at the mercy of individuals online, and where the, where the balance of power is now increasingly equal between individuals and organizations. You cannot simply afford to project an image of what your organization is. You must also be the image. In a sense, honesty is becoming mandatory. I have to grab another sip of water. So the logic is that within organizations, individuals are increasingly empowered, they chatter, they have access to information, and they feel, in the Web 2.0 era, they feel entitled to communicate whatever they want. So in a sense, PR is becoming not just an external activity, but an internal activity. And organizations must be honest, because if they aren't honest, they'll be forced to be honest. We've entered a whole new era this is probably what Alistair Campbell was speaking about yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, I missed it. But we've entered a whole new era of whistleblowing enabled by the network. When you take a look at that earlier diagram of Paul Buran's network, every single node is a potential whistleblower. Every single node within the organization needs to be convinced that what the organization is doing is worthy or worthwhile, or at least explicable, because otherwise they'll blow a whistle. 
And back in the early 60s, when Paul Buran was designing his resilient network, remember that he was working for the military, and he, he said to them, this network will not be open to the same type of administrative censorship that previous networks were, because there will be no single point of control. So right from the beginning, networks as we know them are, in a sense, immune to the kind of control that we are used to exerting. So this is another shift that fits in with plastic information. It's a loss of control. So you have to convince not only, inside, not only outside, but also inside, because otherwise the message will come out. And the assumptions that are driving that message, which make things like WikiLeaks inevitable, are the assumptions of the hackers. So back in the, in the 60s and 70s, in MIT in the United States, there was a laboratory called the Orally Lab. And at the Orally Lab, there was a collection of, of mainly young men who were investigating the very earliest technologies that would lead to a lot of what we know as personal computing. And the culture that evolved around this group of people is, is what we now know as hacking. By hacking, I don't mean breaking into a government network. I mean a different type of attitude. It's a tinkerer's attitude or an engineer's attitude. The idea of the hacker is that he or she must understand everything about an object or a device. They must be able to learn from it. And to be able to learn and explore it and, and optimize it to make it better, they must have full access to it. So back in those days in MIT, an awful lot of the hackers started to read books about lock picking. And they would go around MIT, and they would break all the locks, take whatever equipment they needed, possibly give it back, possibly not, break all the passwords. In a sense, they were absolutely lawless, but they were also incredibly innovative. And the attitudes of the hackers started to spread from MIT all across the United States and beyond. And so you see the young Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, when he was uh, 16 back in 1988, he received his first modem. And with his first modem, he went online for the first time, and he met a bunch of hackers. And he, he took the hacker name Mendax. So Assange, as Mendax, became actually quite, a, quite an impressive hacker. And he started to do what his his peers were doing. He started to break into all sorts of organizations. Uh, some of his, his successes were legendary. But what these individuals were not doing was breaking into organizations for profit. They were breaking into organizations to understand what information was in there, sometimes to share it, but also just to show that they could. So there was a bit of mischief. But the attitude of the hacker is, I deserve to know all information. All information should be out there and should be free. And the world is a better place if there is absolute transparency. So take a look at the WikiLeaks About page. <clears throat> On the About page, you'll see how they make their, their, their case for why they exist and what they do. Essentially, they're saying it is impossible for organizations to control information. And if every individual within those organizations is a potential whistleblower, the behavior of those organizations will, of course, change. And what he's doing is he is appealing to that idea of the empowered individual and what that person can do. So the message is simple. Organizations don't just have to convince everyone else. They have to convince themselves internally that what they're doing is, is, uh, is righteous and useful. And I say this not out of principle, but out of practicality. <clears throat> So, I said that we were at a hinge in history at the beginning. On this side of the hinge in history, PR is not just an external operation, it's an internal one. And tying that thought together with the idea of empowering the periphery of support, and also with the idea of accepting that information is plastic, is the, the, the final fact or rule that I'm going to point to. In a sense, this leads to the close of my presentation. The final rule is about a tone. It's about a way of communicating that is inclusive, a tone of inclusion. We know that the user is king, that the user is in control. We know that the nodes are active, that that new pattern, 
means that everyone is working, either together or against each other, but everyone has a role. We know the power is no longer at the center. That message can't be controlled in the old way. And essentially, we, we know that all the rules have changed for organizations. So this is why the tone has to change. And let's take a look at the, the fathers of the internet. These are three of the, of the individuals who are, you know, probably at the center for, for some of them of establishing what the internet protocol is. What the protocol, and by that I mean the, the technical system that allows different network machines to communicate with each other, what that protocol that ties the internet together is and how it operates. And in a sense, you can see the spirit behind it in this picture. These guys don't take themselves particularly seriously. This is John Postel, Steve Crocker, and Vince Cerf. Now, Steve Crocker is the gentleman in the middle of the photograph at the back with the blue shirt. Crocker, back in 1969, was one of a group of graduate students who was given the job by a bunch of higher-up people to come up with the protocols by which the machines on the new network, at that point an experimental network, would communicate. So he and a bunch of in the academic hierarchy were given this immense task. And they assumed that some grand old professor from the East Coast would roll in and say, I'm going to take over now. That they would be pushed to the side and, and they, were, they were being given a little bit of stuff to play with. And as long as it lasted, it was a good thing. So the, the guys who wrote how the machines communicate to each other had an assumption at the outset of humility. And because they had an assumption of humility and that they might be kicked to the side, they were also very, very keen and aware that they should be as inclusive as possible. They decided that they wouldn't act as if they owned the project. And the project really began late one night in 1969 in a bathroom because Steve Crocker was afraid of waking the friends he was staying with. And so he wrote the first document that, that begins to lay out the process of how machines communicate the internet on the floor of a tile bathroom uh, in 69. And that document was called RFC 1. Now, RFC stands for Request for Comments. And the very tone of that says, we are asking for comment on this document. It doesn't say, this is an instruction or this is a guide. It says, please help us. So request for comments one. Now, I'm going to show you RFC three, request for comments three, again written by Crocker. And it's fascinating to see the kind of language that these pioneers were using. This is the language right built, into the, built right into the DNA of the internet that, in a sense, is exemplary in how organizations can communicate if they want to go with the grain of the technology. Take a look at some of the phrases. First, RFC, request for comment. Now he starts to explain what this group is, this loose group of graduate students all around America. He says, the network working group seems to consist of. <laughs> so there isn't even a clear membership. Anyone can play. It's entirely open. Membership is not closed, he says. Who gets to write these RFCs? Who gets to write the notes that will determine how the machines will communicate to each other? Well, he says, notes may be produced by anybody. Content may be any thought, suggestion, etc. And the minimum length of a network working group note is one sentence. And the reason he caps it off, the reason why it's written this way, is that, quote, we hope to promote the exchange of considerably less than authoritative ideas. So what Crocker is saying is, we're just putting this out there. Please come and play with us. Anyone can contribute. Now, in academia, certainly not in Cambridge where I did my PhD, in academia, this is not normal. <laughs> this attitude of, uh, we don't really know what we're doing, and you know, maybe we'll just give it a shot, that doesn't happen. And the reason they acted this way is because they were terrified that an authority would come down from on high and push them to the side. So right from the beginning, the tone is inclusive, and it says, we are just one node among many. They could have said, we are a big, important organization doing one of the most important scientific projects the world has ever known. But what they actually said is something along the lines of, 
I have to write on a bathroom floor, my butt's probably very cold, and I really hope that you don't criticize my document. And that's how it began. Now, this is RFC 3. There are thousands of requests for, for comments now. There's an archive of them. Every time there's a new, any new type of uh, communication system to do with, with, a, with a computer and with the internet, any time that happens, the specifications go through a collaborative process, the RFC process, which any one of us could actually participate in. So the process is still open, even though this is one of the biggest industries in the world. There's something in the way that the RFC process works that shows how we can communicate in this new age. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me, I want to leave some time for questions. So I'm just going to sum up um, with uh, a recap. It seems to me that there are five fairly clear factors or rules to centrifugal communications. And to bring it back to the beginning, we're used to a world of centralized communications where you can control the message and you're the point that sends the information out there and everyone else receives. And obviously that has changed. So the first fact is that we have to respect the power of individuals. The individual doesn't just talk back. The individual might form a group which talks back better than you've been talking at the group. Second thing is the new plasticity of information, that you cannot control the message once it leaves you. And that, in a sense, you must accept that the information may change and be contorted. You may have to fight against that, but don't be surprised that it happens. And when you're fighting against it, you're fighting against the change to that information as an equal, as an equal node. The third thing is the strength at the periphery that organizations have a new resource that Jerry Brown back in 1992 could not tap into because all he had was a toll-free phone line. That the internet lets you tap into a potentially unbelievably powerful network of people. They may not know each other, and you may be the glue that binds them together to help you in your ends. But of course, that is provided that you are being honest. <clears throat> because if you aren't, you're almost certainly going to be caught being dishonest. So there is a practical reason for organizations to be worthy. This isn't just about corporate social responsibility. It's about the fact that every single one of your employees is now emitting messages about how you behave. And then the fifth point, which I'm going to conclude on, is that final point about tone. I apologize. <clears throat> is that final point about tone. If these four facts are correct, if this is the way to behave, then the message comes from those RFC documents. We must have a tone of inclusion. Not only should we be open and transparent, but we should invite participation, because the participation will come anyway, but it may be negative if you don't ask for it. So just to, to conclude, <clears throat> I want to thank you again, Thomas, and Eric, thank you very much. Um, I hope this has been useful. Uh, please join me on Twitter. And, um, and uh, if there are any projects that anyone is working on that has anything to do with these, these, these themes, I'd be delighted to help. Uh, let me know how I can. Thank you very much.